what I want to do this weekend and tonight especially is I'm going to talk about a seismic change in the way people think. And I'm not talking about just people in the church, but people in the world. The entire world is looking at truth a completely different way than our grandparents looked at it. And in fact, truth today is thought of and assessed and evaluated in a completely different way than it was just 20 years ago. Now, some of you are in my generation. I went to school in the 60s and 70s. If you went to college today and you went to, you went to college in my era and then went again today, you'd see it's totally different. The way truth is dealt with is entirely different. There have been seismic changes in the way the world looks at truth, the way philosophers talk about truth, and all of that. And I want to sort of explain that to you as simply as possible in layman's terms tonight. And then tomorrow we'll talk about how that is beginning to infect even the evangelical church, so that how even some of the best churches in the country are being tripped up by the new ways of looking at truth. And I want to start with 2 Timothy 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3, a familiar passage to most of you. Here the Apostle Paul is cautioning Timothy that perilous times would come in the last days. And here is how he described it. Paul writing, 2 Timothy chapter 3, I'll read verses 1 through 7. But know this, that in the last days... Perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unforgiving, unloving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. Now, let me pause and say up to this point, Paul is pretty much describing what human depravity looks like. He says this is times are coming in the last days. The truth is humanity has always had these elements. It's part of our fallen nature. And secular and fallen sinful people always manifest these things. What Paul is telling Timothy is that in the last days, these things will all grow worse. And then he says this amazing thing in verse 5, accompanying that you'll have this outburst of religious fervor when people have a form of godliness, but they deny the power of godliness. And he says this to Timothy, from such people turn away. For of this sort are those who creep into households and make captives of gullible women, loaded down with sins, led away by various lusts. He's, he's basically calling people like this creeps. They're creepy. They creep into houses, he says. He's, he's portraying them as criminals. They creep into houses, people who sneak into houses. Thieves. They're thieves of what? Thieves of truth. That's the idea. It's not that they literally creep into houses and, and kidnap women. It's that morally they are on that same level. And what they do with the truth is what a thief who breaks into the house and kidnaps a woman does in, you know, in, in, in uh, regular terms. He's comparing it to that sort of crime. This is a crime against the truth. And then he says this, and this is the key verse, verse 7. This is the verse we're going to start with, and this sort of sums up what we're going to say. They are always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. That last phrase is so very telling. Always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. That is a perfect description of the times in which we live, number one. But think about it this way. That is also a perfect description of the course of secular human philosophy. If you study the history of philosophy, here's what you'll see. Philosophy as a discipline is a long history, uh, it's a long series of attempts by unbelieving men to define truth apart from God. And every philosophical system in the history of humanity has, that has tried to explain truth without reference to God has failed. Every one of them. In fact, here's how I'm, I told Ray I'm editing this book, and John MacArthur's dealing with some of these things in this book. The book is called The Truth War. He's talking about the, the war against the truth that really began in the garden when Satan said to Eve, did God really say that? 
questioning the authority of God's word, questioning what God's word actually says, that was the beginning of the war against truth. And it's gone on throughout the history of humanity. Here's what John MacArthur says about the process of philosophy. He says, elaborate systems of thought have been proposed and methodically debunked one after another, like a long chain in which every previous link is broken. For thousands of years, the very, very best of human philosophies have all utterly failed to account for truth apart from God. And that's true, by the way. And in our lifetime, just in the past 20 years, a remarkable thing has happened. Western philosophy and academic thinkers have basically begun to realize that you cannot have the concept of truth you can't have a coherent idea of truth and what it is apart from God. They have been always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. But rather than recognizing that if you want truth, you've got to have God with it, what the secular mind has done is given up the search for truth altogether. And for, for perhaps the first time ever in human history, the dominant idea that is driving the thinking of secular minds today is the idea that if truth exists somewhere, we cannot know it for sure. We just can't know what the truth is. Nobody can know for sure what the truth is. That is the dominant idea today, and it's been embraced almost universally in the secular world. And our entire society is beginning to embrace the idea that truth really doesn't matter much anyway. We've witnessed a major transition in a, in, a, in a whole new phase of intellectual human history just within our lifetimes, just within the past 20 years. And it happened so quickly and so imperceptibly that while I'm sure you've all noticed that things have changed in the past 20 years and changed significantly, you may not yet be aware of why or what is behind this thinking. The new phase in the history of human thought is, has been labeled postmodernism. And it is a classic example of the very thing the Apostle Paul is describing when he writes to Timothy in that text I read. Postmodern philosophers are always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And that is practically the very way any committed postmodernist would describe his own way of thinking. He would tell you that it's a good and beneficial way of looking at the quest for human knowledge, that we can always learn things, but we can never really arrive at the knowledge of the truth. That is the postmodern mindset. And in fact, the postmodernist would say, that's the way it's supposed to be, that's good, that's the way you should think of the quest for truth. We're never supposed to think that we've come to the knowledge of the truth, and that's not even a desirable goal for the postmodernist. That's what the idea that drives the times in which we live. Now, most of you by now have probably heard the term postmodernism in other contexts. I know it's on the, on the flyer that you got when you came. You know that's what we're talking about tonight. Um, but I'm guessing you've heard that term here and there before. And if you are in any generation older than mine, that if you grew up in the church, you probably grew up hearing about modernism. Not postmodernism, but modernism. And if so, if you grew up in the church, that word modernism probably has a very sinister ring to it. And well, it should, because from about 1850 until less than 20 years ago, modernism was the main secular threat to Christianity, to a biblical worldview. Modernism was supposedly scientific and rational and opposed to the idea of anything supernatural. It was inherently anti-Christian. Naturally, modernism didn't go well with the idea of Christianity because it was anti-supernatural. And if you grew up in an evangelical church, your spiritual fathers and grandfathers spent their lives fighting modernism in the church. And, and they should have, because modernism was a great danger. It ravaged the Western world in the 20th century. It, uh, it it tore organized Christianity apart. It destroyed most of the mainstream Protestant denominations in America. Modernism is the reason the mainstream denominations all went liberal between the 1920s and the 1970s. But you know what? Modernism is now dead. Even in the majority of the secular academic environments, 
modernism has not been the prevailing worldview since the fall of the Berlin Wall. We live in a postmodern culture now. And if you were to go to college today in most secular universities, you would be taught by professors who are almost completely and totally postmodernists, not modernists anymore. Now, that sounds like good news for the church, doesn't it? Because if modernism was evil and modernism is dead, shouldn't we rejoice about that? I mean, shouldn't we be glad for whatever way of thinking takes the place of modernism? And that's how a lot of people in the church today think. And as a result, postmodernism is quickly moving into churches and taking over. We'll talk about this in detail tomorrow, and I'll show you how, but let me just say this. Last November, two years ago in November, Christianity Today featured a cover article titled The Emergent Mystique. It was about this movement called the uh, Emerging Church, and it describes how postmodernism is affecting the church. And this is the latest fashion in cultural rel relevance. It's beyond the seeker-sensitive churches. It's beyond what they were doing at Willow Creek and, uh, and Saddleback 10 years ago. This goes beyond this. It's an attempt to be culturally relevant to the next generation, to the postmodern generation. And if you have never heard that expression, the emerging church, you will hear it. You'll be hearing about it a lot because it's going to dominate the conversation in the evangelical movement for at least the next 10 years. The emergent church is simply the nickname for a movement that's trying to blend Christianity with postmodernism. That's the whole agenda of the movement. Now, I want to be as clear and as brutally honest with you as possible right from the get-go. I don't want you to have any misunderstanding about where I stand. I am convinced that postmodernism is inherently incompatible with biblical Christianity. And in fact, the most essential elements of postmodernism are hostile to the fundamental truth claims of Scripture. And for that reason, I would argue that a, a postmodern mindset involves some positively sinful ways of thinking. Now, if you do any reading on church growth philosophy, or even if you just try to stay abreast, as I know Ray does, and tries to keep those of you who are part of this congregation up to date on what is popular in the evangelical world, you, you may already realize that there are a number of pastors and church leaders out there who are sending the message that they think the church needs to adapt to postmodernism, to embrace postmodernism, and, and to absorb postmodern style and language in order to reach a postmodern generation. Now, I, and I am convinced that the error in that approach is no different from the error 150 years ago uh, of those people who tried to devise a modernist brand of Christianity in order to reach the modern world. It's the same kind of mentality. The heart of biblical and Christian truth will be destroyed in the process. Now, I, I want to explain to you what modernism is, and I want to explain to you what postmodernism is, so you can keep all of this straight. I'll try to be as simple as possible. Remember, modernism was inherently anti-Christian, anti-supernatural. It represented the wholesale rejection of some vital biblical truths. And that's why, even though lots of people tried, and they tried for years, it proved totally impossible to blend biblical Christianity with modernism. Couldn't be done. Nobody ever did it. There were many churches and many denominations that tried, and all of them died. They went liberal and died. And the evangelical leaders who are our spiritual forefathers, men like Spurgeon and J. Gresham Machen and B.B. Warfield, they were a handful of leaders in the church who saw clearly from the outset that modernism was incompatible with biblical truth and they devoted their lives to fighting the modernist trend. But in exactly the same way, postmodernists are doing the same thing with Christianity today. The postmodernist's way of looking at the world is fundamentally anti-Christian. And if anything, I would say postmodernism is worse than modernism was, and I want to show you why. Both modernism and postmodernism are exactly the kinds of evil ideology the Apostle Paul described in 2 Corinthians 10, verses 4 and 5, where he spoke of our spiritual warfare as Christians this way. He said, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, 
but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing or pretension is the, is the Greek word that exalts.